Hello, challengers. I'm Rafael Donaro, Java Champion. And uh, today I have here Juarez Barbosa Jr. And Juarez has over 20 years of professional experience in software engineering and uh, developer relations. He is a senior principal Java developer evangelist and director of developer evangelism at Oracle. He has a lot of experience and he has a lot to share with us. And he's also very involved in the Java community. Hello, Jardis. Very happy to have you here. Hi, Rafael. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure is mine. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, we're going to be talking here about the steps to become a DevRel and how was the um, journey of Juarez. And let's start with what is a DevRel exactly. So can you tell us, Juarez, what is a DevRel? Oh, okay. DevRel stands for developer relations. So it's all about managing the relationships and the interactions with developer communities. Of course, with a focus on developers, but also all the technical people, software architects, director of engineering, VP of engineering, and the, C the CTO, and so on, right? And DevRel is interesting because under the developer relations umbrella, we have several different specialized areas like what we can call developer advocacy, which focuses more on the outreach side of DevRel. But we can also have things like developer engagement. It is more uh, aligned and responsible for organizing technical events and measuring impact and orchestrating activity. And um, developer and community management as well, more involved in managing technical documentation, resources, wikis, and also discussion forums. And and there are two main roles. The first one is, of course, what is called a developer advocate, which is responsible for addressing the developers, presenting technical subjects as expected. But there's a more specialized role. It depends on the organization because for some organizations, those areas, they sit in engineering or marketing, but the other one is a developer evangelist. And regardless of each, which area that the practice is actually within the organization located, the developer evangelist can also approach and, and talk with the business audience. So discuss business requirements as well, beyond the usual technical topics. Very good. And what's the difference exactly between a dev rel and an evangelist? Is this the same thing or? Oh, it is pretty much the same thing, but. Not a real an evangelist, but I would say a developer advocate and developer evangelist. Advocates usually they focus more on talking strictly or perhaps mostly with the developers, engineers, the technical people, but evangelists they can also address the C level. Oh, interesting. Okay. And you talk to developers and the C level as well, right? As a developer evangelist, yes. It depends also on the engagement. If that's a conference or perhaps a product showcase, a special event only with customers and, or perhaps press and media, but in general, yes, we can, a developer evangelist, they are actually prepared to talk with both technical and business people. Very good. And is there a specific product? you promote or it, it depends? From the developer advocate standpoint, actually it depends. Of course, so usually as you are representing a company that wants to promote a specific technology, there is an alignment with the product or a service or even a platform. But you can also, as part of uh, the narrative, embed things like open source and other interesting technologies as well. So usually at the end of the day, it's just a mix of everything. Yeah. You, you can be creative and also design your strategy and the general execution to actually perhaps better leverage both opportunities. That's a good strategy, how we can perhaps consider to work. Yeah. 
Very good. And what was your journey to become a DevRel? Well, quite interesting because initially it was not something planned or that I actually desired or I perhaps selected as one of my goals. It happened because first I acted as a Java users group, a leader for nearly 10 years in a row, Brazil, managerized state. And that involves organizing events, but also presenting and when finding speakers, when sponsors, supporters. And a second experience, actually, 19, during the 90s, 1999 or so, uh, Nokia and Ericsson, they started to have those developer portals to discover their technology. At that time, it was about mobile phones and creating pages for mobile phones, the wireless access protocol, and so on. And I got involved in those uh, discussion boards, also writing and supporting the wiki for mobile developers, posting code samples, and practicing a little bit because I was also learning the technology. And with that, I realized that I was good at writing blog posts and creating and sharing code samples. So I started to actually have a strategy where if I needed to create, I don't know, a component or specific solution to one of my projects, given that there was no proprietary information or confidential information involved, I would factor out the solutions from a technical standpoint and share that, you know, with other communities and create blog posts, some code samples as well. And that's how it happened, essentially. And I can say that most developer advocates, apart from those companies where they have an entire mature practice in DevRel, where they can also have interns and trainees and the, the graduates and so on to be trained. Many developer advocates actually, they end up becoming you know, part of a DevRel team because they are not only good software engineers, but they also produce a good content. So they know how to actually not only create something that is useful, but also present that to uh, a technical audience. And there are various forms of uh, content that we can create. Blog posts, code samples, you can participate in hackathons, conferences, meetups. Pretty much all the different developer relations motions are comprised by that. Plenty of opportunities for engineers to get involved. Awesome. And so you mentioned that you've been a jet leader for 10 years. So in your point of view, do you think it's crucial to share your knowledge to become a dev rel? I would not say it is crucial, but it is an important factor because at the end of the day, dev rel has everything to do with reaching out to developers and fostering communities and having proper relationships. Some people think that DevRel is all about going to conferences, events, and participating in talks, roundtables, and so on. But there's considerable effort behind the scenes every time you get involved with a specific customer or event in terms of software engineering, creating labs, creating code samples. During the events, we also have meaningful interactions our booths and during the sessions as well. So we try to collect feedback from the community and then relay that feedback uh, to our internal team, software engineers, product managers, and so on. So we can really improve our product, possibly also helping identify gaps, fixing bugs. It depends on the interaction. But I would say, yes, it is. Important, but not the main factor, or there are many other things that are actually expected by this role. And what is the most important? What are the main factors for developers who want to become a dev rel? Oh, I would say that a good start is to try to give back to the community, as I said, contribute, participate in open source projects, not only help to organize hackathons. I don't know, discussion forums, groups, there are plenty of different 
ways that developers can use all the paths are available. Pretty much all the big cities nowadays, they have many meetups, you know, in organizations. Now we have this digital world, so you can also engage in online events, hackathons. It's just a matter of deciding. And of course, your networking is an important factor as well. So you can leverage your network, your recruiters, friends to figure out additional ways that you can interact with the developer community. But there are always many opportunities. Awesome. And those DevRel positions, they are not uh, publicly posted, right? You can't find a DevRel position. Usually what happens, what I see in the market is that there are people from companies who are aware of uh, the developers who are sharing their knowledge. And those positions are usually offered to developers who share their knowledge, right? What is your point of view on that? I would think that's somehow correct. It happens because at the end of the day, there are only a few thousands developer advocates worldwide. So it's a community. We have some also specific conferences to discuss all the things DevRel and so on. And so many interactions and activities happen in the scope of those engagements. And some companies, they do want to advertise it, but it is perhaps a common practice to also hire the way you were talking about by leveraging a network and also reaching out to people who really know how to uh, run DevRel motions because it seems to be an easy play, but it is not uh, just uh, the usual task set of uh, software engineers. You go to your cubicle and you have requirements and code, and then possibly you present that uh, when you are delivering a project. There are many additional activities and skills that are required actually to deliver what is the expectation for the different deliverables activities involved in DevRel. So you are right. Yeah. It is perhaps uh, just, of course, there are exceptions to all rules in DevRel as well. So yeah. uh, no tricks here, but yeah, I would say that usually a dev advocates, they communicate well. Yeah. And that's a rare set of skills, right? Even more for our developers, because most developers are introverts. It's very difficult for developers to give a talk and write articles a bit easier, but to give talks, that's a big challenge. And you can count the developers to have this set of skills of being good technically and being able to give talks. That's another reason why they do that. They hire through networking. And also, like you said, there are around 1,000 dev rails in the, in the world. It's not so many, op not so many, uh, opportunities in the market to become a dev route. So you need to stand yes, out in I some way. With, I agree that some very uh, strong with rock solid skills, software engineers, they miss this opportunity of actually learning how to engage with an audience and also present ideas and discuss requirements try to innovate on top of the projects they are working on. And that's actually a skill, but it is not that difficult, actually. It is a matter of seeing the activities that you have as a software engineer uh, in a different way. Uh, in every project, every organization, uh, usually they offer uh, good opportunities for you to start to upskill regarding the additional abilities that are required to play a developer advocate role. Of course, you can, and you have, you must focus on the core activities of a software engineer, but uh, there are perhaps some creative ways of pursuing the path of a DevRel guy as well, while playing the role of a software engineer. Yeah. And for developers who struggle to give talks, what tip would you give to them to break this fear of giving talks and sharing their knowledge? Quite frankly, I think that any skill can be developed. The problem is that some developers or engineers, they don't have the experience to go to those stages where we have an audience of, of I don't know, 
1,000, 2,000, 5,000 people, right? So they try to start with events that perhaps are not the best ones for them. But if you consider the local meetups as an example, it is just a more controlled and easy way for you to practice and start learning about public speaking and how to uh, get involved in the community in terms of uh, discussing ideas and framing different uh, subjects, so on. Uh, so my best advice would be to start first with small events and some uh, simple engagements. And then, of course, uh, you can then uh, move upwards in terms of pursuing bigger events and wider audiences. Awesome. Have you ever done a keynote? Oh, yes, many times. Yes, yes. A recent one last week, actually. Awesome. Can you uh, share? Go ahead. No, please ask your question. <laughs> Can you share what a developer should do to do keynotes? Okay. The keynotes, they are interesting. I actually love keynotes because usually the keynote, you can go and have the leeway to develop a given subject and with your point of view, be more opinionated about things perhaps challenge status quo a little bit. Usually my keynotes, I do a ton of research as we know in terms of trends and so on to, to perhaps make people think about the future and things that can happen and perhaps envision the, uh, how the technologies are developing and how things are evolving and so on. I don't have actually kind of methodology or process to engage in terms of delivering keynotes because I just explore everything and then I go there and do it in a kind of a freestyle way. It is different when you have a talk and you are selected and you are added to an events program and you have to talk about one topic and then present it the best way you can and so on. I think keynotes, they are more, I don't know, relaxed or interesting in terms of how far you can go regarding the discussions and the way that you want to frame a specific topic. Yeah, I heard that in keynotes, your subject has to be a little bit more generic. Absolutely. It involves pretty much all the uh, best opportunities in terms of uh, delivering uh, your message in the way that you perhaps uh, see the, the topic at the hand. Awesome. So Jardis, tell us what is the routine of a DevRel? Oh, it's interesting because as I said, people think that it's only about creating content and uh, the external developer outreach activities, flights and, and events and conferences and networking and talking with developers. But we also focus strongly on the engineering side of it. So we discuss features with the product managers. As I said, we collect feedback from the community. We discuss our roadmaps. Also strong collaboration with engineering in terms of providing customer support. We create workshops and labs as well, hands-on labs. So some of our events, we run those labs so developers can go and perform in a practical way these steps to master given technology. In terms of upskilling blog posts, in code samples. Every day I also have activities related to that. What else? Participation in the call for papers. That's a considerable effort as well because you have to think about your talks, the abstracts, submit the proposals, track the proposers. If you are selected for a proposal, you have to discuss it internally with your team and also the event organizers session preparation and for the D-Days at the event and so on. But all those activities that I talked about, actually every day I perform a little bit of each of them, right? But if you are traveling on the go, of course, you have to adapt. Some people don't like it, but usually I write a blog post in transit at airports as well as restaurants. If you see me and my laptop is open, it is because I'm creating value, adding something to one of my plans in terms of the execution. Awesome. Well, yes, a lot of work to write articles or produce 
content, participate in roadmaps. You are also a decision maker, right? We are somehow because we have some specific forums that we vote for features. We discuss the features and so on. Another aspect that is extremely important as well, we never stop learning. We have to follow the trends, read about uh, the latest technologies. First, the ones that are more aligned with uh, the core focus you have in terms of the mission in Endeavor, right? Or the specific group or technology or service that you are promoting. But in general, at events, I also, every time I have a chance, I participate in several ch sessions, not only as a speaker, but also as an attendee. And I talk with the event attendees as well, all the developers, we exchange ideas. So it is quite rich in terms of the experience, you no, know, but the requirement of always learning and keeping up with the latest advancements, uh, that's extremely important for a developer advocate. Yeah. So I'm curious about this, right? You mentioned about keeping up with technology. This is something very challenging for every developer. This is maybe one of the biggest pain points for developers because there are infinite things to learn. So what's your strategy exactly? Because we all know that nowadays AI is going sky high, right? But you also have specific products from Oracle to, to understand and to decide what features you should include. So what is your strategy to learn more, for example, about the cloud and services and AI and whatever technology that is showing up? Doing software engineering and dev around for, I would say, nearly 30 years now, I can say that one of the most important aspects is to realize that things now, they move at a different speed. In the past, for example, I don't know, two decades ago. So if you wanted to learn about Java or perhaps Java, the language, not the platforms, or perhaps the C language and C++, you would read three, five, six books. And that would be a very good uh, start for you, a pretty decent one. But nowadays, of course, if you want to learn about AI or IoT or quantum computing or blockchain, we are talking about entire universes of information and different moving parts and so on. So it's important for you to be a generalist in terms of the core computer science concepts and all the core aspects in computing in general. And that you can use as a baseline to pursue one or two specific areas and become an expert in those areas, right? Because as I said now, if you don't do that, you can still be a generalist, but it will be difficult for you to be a developer advocate because actually you, when you have this mission as a developer advocate in that realm, you'll have a kind of set of different services and products and technologies that you should focus on. And you are expected to become perhaps not a master, but an expert in those technologies. And also how uh, you should orchestrate, in my case, the internal things, Oracle, to get the meaningful waivers to customers, because customers, they have very important requirements regarding the specific businesses and the information domain and the problems they have, and they want to provide solutions. So. I will say that is the main aspect to realize that now, although it is important for you to be a generalist and know core concepts and so on, you have to become an expert in that field. So if you decide to go the DevRel path and become a developer advocate, I would advise you to pick one or two specific areas and focus on those. How to choose those two specific areas? Can you give me an example? Oh, that's actually a tricky question because it is somehow too broad in terms of it, it, it touches the aspect of personal choices and preferences. It's a challenge for me, actually, because I started many years ago with some 
simple programming languages and the entire PC evolution happened. And actually, I was lucky enough to see the same happening in the scope of mobile uh, development and mobile applications as well as I said. Even with the advent of the first feature phones, the Java Micro Edition phones and so on. And uh, particularly, and personally, I love everything. <laughs> it's difficult for me actually to say, oh, well, this is your thing or I love all things computing. But of course, as an example, I'm a Java developer, you know, for decades now, but I worked for Oracle during my first chapter of the company as a blockchain developer advocate as well, you know, which is still involved Java as well, you know, with some of the frameworks and clients with Hyperledger and so on, doing a little bit of smart contracts with Java as well, but other programming languages in a kind of a different world with plenty of other languages like Solidity and Python, Rust, and so on. But yeah, I, I think that's it. We also need to be strategic for our careers, right? Because if we learn only for personal interests, like our career is going to be the, the second option and our growth will be slow. So how do you decide what to focus on? thinking about your career. That's interesting because act, acting as a leader uh, in a lead for many software engineers in the past and recently, if you don't have a proper balance in terms of things or technologies that you like, and the mission and the goals that you have, possibly you will actually lose a confidence or perhaps don't have the motivation or the drive to achieve and execute your plan. I agree with you. You should not, of course, focus 100% on choices or dreams only, right? You have to be practical, but it is definitely a factor that you have to take into consideration. For motivation, you mean. So developers should also learn some things that they are interested in because they will get more motivated and also not to put their whole time on personal projects because they are also their career. There is also their career, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And the best is to combine efforts to achieve the, the perhaps the desired results both ways. So if you identify synergies regarding your personal operation and what you are performing or using during your job time, that's a win-win situation for both the company and you as a professional. You mentioned about topic that is very interesting to me because many developers who reach out to me for mentorship, in some way, their confidence is harmed. They don't feel confident enough to sometimes to earn more or to do their jobs in the best way. So what would you recommend for developers to Stay sharp with technologies. Let's make it simpler. Should be confident with technologies. That's an interesting question because in tech, we have the so-called imposter syndrome. So the guys always think that, oh, my colleague knows it better than me, or I'm missing this, that, the, the fear of missing now, right? I think. Uh, but uh, there's no, I would say, magic recipe or silver bullet. Actually, you have to actually be serious about your career and really have the discipline, uh, be stoic perhaps towards uh, pursuing your goals and actually align that with, uh, as I said, something that is interesting or motivating you to uh, have the drive and achieve your goals. Right? No tricks here. Unfortunately, as I said, you have to be serious, be disciplined towards pursuing what you want to do. And the imposter syndrome or not achieving or perhaps, or not pursuing your goals at the end of the day, it is a personal decision as well. You have to figure out your way, identify your weaknesses and address them and, and try to also uh, fortify uh, your strong, the strong aspects of your profile and your skills. And with that, I'm sure I've seen Many developers grow from trainees or junior developers to be 
amazing developers working for the best companies worldwide with roles that are beyond senior. One of the top of guys from Minas Gerais who acted as a job leaders after I actually decided to move forward. They are now just working with brilliant careers. And I saw them actually work on their plans and I supported them a little bit as well, not perhaps as a direct mentor, but as, in, as an indirect supporter to achieve that. And, and the recipe is that if you decide to do it, if you have the disciplines, if you are serious, you will achieve it. Very good. So what elements do you think that they, what exactly they applied in their career? to grow from trainee to beyond senior. You have to focus on the core pillars of, as I said, doing and executing your play in a serious way, having a clear list of objectives and goals and, and being disciplined. But what I can say about those guys, I talk about them because I remember seeing them really growing the right way, but that other guys also participated in the same cohort. But at the end of the day, they decided to really execute and have the discipline to focus on the goals, remove distractions, all those bits that are important. In terms of evolving careers, that's a tricky aspect of it because there are so many external factors that will influence that if you are working for the same company and if so, the company size, if there's a structured career plan, and if your managers are supporters. And with the entire company policy in terms of HR and so on. And, but, you know, on the other side, if you are working for a small company with not so well-defined processes, it, it is still possible, but usually it involves a little bit of also building bridges and having the rapport and the right relationship with uh, the key decision makers inside the company in terms of the engineering practice. Also making an impact on a personal stance on the projects that you are working on and how you are performing your contributions and some things that uh, developers and software engineers overlook also the visibility of what you are doing is extremely important as well, right? Because it does matter if you have the best code and the most performant code and you are addressing all the requirements if nobody knows about it, right? Good things should be shared and promoted and amplified, but some uh, software engineers, they overlook that. Yeah. And then it doesn't matter too much if you're creating value, but not showing the work to the key people who could promote you, then it's, it's very difficult to be promoted like that. So you should know how to show your work and you can't be that developer who is afraid to show the work, obviously I'm not saying that developer should be that annoying person that is always bragging about what they did. They have to make their work as much visible as possible. Otherwise promotion is difficult to happen. Absolutely. And I like it when you're talking about bragging because you have to do it the ethical way, right? Being a responsible, not taking other people's credits. Too much politics is also not something desirable because some people, they don't really deliver or make an impact, but they try to perhaps progress their careers using soft skills. They are important as well. All those things at the end of the day, they complement your strategy in terms of a proper and solid execution, but do it the right way. In an ethical way, you know, with sharing and over promoting things, over committing, committing is also always risky. Sometimes you need to be a good leader, identify your team members and the people you can collaborate and their skills and how they can better interact by actually distributing tasks and delegating the right way. If you know that, I don't know, as part of a DevRel team, guy is amazing and very good at recording videos and producing videos. The guy is better at blogging and so on. It seems to be 
um, good strategy maybe to divide the workload instead of having all the guys doing the same thing. Because if you cannot accelerate someone who's really good at something to produce and uh, deliver results that are on par or beyond the best guys in the area, that's something desirable. So all of those decisions, as I said, of course, you have to analyze and measure things on daily to daily basis. It's an ongoing effort, but uh, you can do it. Awesome. You mentioned something that is interesting to me as well, because that's another pain point from many developers. You mentioned about discipline. Do you have a strategy to be more disciplined on your studies? Because I know it's difficult nowadays. There are so many distractions. You have social media, you have notifications all the time, many things happening, family. So what do you do to stay disciplined? That's interesting because we think that we have to create complex processes and when and do a ton of things actually to achieve better time management and better focus and discipline, but it is extremely simple. Just focus, right? If you don't work at play, don't play at work. That's a simple one. Another thing, multitasking is a lie. There's no way to multitask. We as humans, I think it is easier for you to focus on the most difficult tasks. First, as an example, in the morning, when you have a fresh mind and address those, and then you can move to work on the more simple ones or more sophisticated ones, if you decide. And I think discipline is something that you have to remove all the disturbances and the, the interruptions and distractions in terms of technology, no notifications. I use a couple of mobile phones, but when I'm focusing, they are turned off or I put them in flight mode and so I can control the interruptions. In the simpler task, well, as I said, if you see a task, it's a productivity act. And if it takes three to five minutes, minutes at most to complete it, do it immediately, right away. Go address it, close it, solve the next one. So those things, as I said, I don't have any special process or recipe to share. It is only about controlling the interruptions, distractions, disruptions, and avoid multitasking. That's a critical one. Some people, they underestimate it or they think, no, I can multitask, but the quality and the speed of execution is not the same. Developers can give it a try and realize by themselves uh, what is, perhaps what is good for me is not better for, is not uh, the best approach for everyone. Uh, that's how I do it. Yeah. You mentioned some important points there. So there's even a book about doing the most difficult thing at first. It's called It's the Frog. And uh, this book, they explain this concept about doing the most difficult thing first, because when we wake up, it's the time that we have the most willpower. The other thing I do to be disciplined on my studies and my goals is to use the Pomodoro technique. Mm -hmm. So I think it's excellent because once I start the timer, it's 25 minutes nonstop. I'll focus. I won't check my phone. I won't check anything else. I'll just focus 100% on that task. And like you said, there isn't much tasking. You need to focus on the task we decided and you keep working on that. If you keep changing, your concentration level will go down. I like the Pomodoro as well because uh, the time it gives you also to have a break, to relax, refresh your mind is important. Sometimes you will have a, a complex problem that you have to tackle and you are struggling. Those breaks, they really help. Currently, I'm not using any applications or tools to work with the Pomodoro technique, but I also have my breaks and I control and I, I feel it when you are doing it for, for years, how you should organize the way that you are executing the tasks, but it is definitely a very good technique to use. Yes. I really like it because 
then you can focus and you can also track your progress. That's really interesting because on those from Dharma tools, you can see how many hours you invested in your work or in your studies, in your goals. That's very interesting because that way we have better control on how many hours we are using to advance in our careers. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, you you made me remember blog post or news article discussing that in, uh, as a kind of productivity hack. It was recommended for you to also take notes of all your interruptions and disruptions, notifications and things. And then at the end of the day, uh, you should analyze it and compute the number of hours so you can start to perhaps control it in a better way to achieve a better balance in terms of replacing those distractions with activities that really deliver value for you. Yeah. So going back to the DevRel subject, can you practice your, techn your technical skills as much as a software developer? as a dev rel or is it more difficult? So what's your point of view on that? I think so, because as I said, a, a considerable uh, part of what I do is also to watch the competitors. So we do uh, many POCs, um, competitive intelligence as well. We analyze um, the competitors' products. Sometimes we also test open source technology and all those things. And on top of that, uh, the usual activities related to the programming languages, the pro products and services that uh, we represent as developer advocates. So there's always something engineering related involved. Coding, you are creating a code sample, you are preparing a talk and there is a demo. You are creating the workshops or the hands-on labs. So every day we also do many activities that involve coding and exploration and investigation as well. In terms of trends, research, identify new technologies, test them, perhaps combine them with something that we want to promote so we can add a bit of perhaps curiosity and the un uh, an interesting side to what we want to deliver. So yes, it is not so difficult because to do a good job as a developer advocate, you have to be actually following constantly the trends, the technologies, learning about them so you can go to approach developers and teach them how to use the deck. Awesome. How many trips do you do on average as a DevRel? And is this something you enjoy about being a DevRel as well? I think it is a challenge as well because flights, and airports and security, everything, and usually immigration as well. And when commuting from one place to another, and, but it's quite nice. I think the good aspect is that you get to know about many interesting projects. You meet nice people, you make good friends. You also, as I said, when you are attending an event, perhaps as a speaker to deliver a talk, you also see other people are presenting about interesting topics and in terms of travel, it depends. There are some events, some periods, there are more online events. Sometimes you have plenty of in-person events to participate over the span of two or three weeks. So you have to travel and be away from home for a while, but it's always interesting. So it helps at the end of the day to make it more friendly and Perhaps um, you feel pleased to have all those great opportunities. I love communities. I cannot see anything that will, I would cite as uh, negative. Of course, perhaps because I like what I do, which is for me is quite important as well. But of course, it is not so easy as it seems. You are not you working nine to five and coding and, and eating and making your coffee. And, yeah, there are other activities that take time and sometimes you are too tired, you sleep, I don't know, 
three, four, five hours, and then you have to go to an event the next morning and then present. And but it's nice. It's nice. Yeah, I imagine you give more than 100 talks in the year, right? Depending on how active the year is, and there are an event, there are some events that you are invited and you don't even say an abstract. Some events you send abstracts and you get to approvals. Some events the company invites you to participate in, cost more engagements as well. Some hackathons you go as a hacker, as a developer, as well as a mentor, right? So all the interactions, they uh, have some different things in terms of the nature, the way that they happen. But yes, at the end of the day, it's quite active and demanding, but it's a good thing. It's a nice role. You learn a tool. You are always learning and experiencing new technologies, talking with different communities, seeing how they can organize and orchestrate activities, the local Cosmos projects as well. So yeah, it, it's quite vibrant. It's an interesting area. Awesome. How many countries in average do you visit during the year, like more than 50? It depends on the year, no, but I would say countries, it depends. If, because if you focus on a specific market or area, I don't know, Europe or as a whole or Western Europe or Eastern Europe or EMEA or perhaps, I don't know, Asia or as a global developer advocate as well, we'll have a variation in, in, in terms of the number of countries. But cities, I would say so, yeah, 40, 50, or even, I don't know, 10 or two dozens over, yeah, I would say 50 cities is, is a reasonable number. Yeah. yeah. Very good. How long do you stay at home and how long do you stay traveling? As that right? Um, yeah, that, that's actually something quite difficult to predict. Because when you start your year, we have a plan in terms of execution. So you have to prepare and watch the events, the call for papers, submissions, and then as part of the business orchestration, also collaborate with the internal teams to identify opportunities to present to internal audiences as well, to engage with customers and so on. But so. There is never, a, I would say, a right and easy way for you to predict the number of conferences or events or engagements you will have. It's a rolling activity. So as the year progresses, you will start to realize and your plan starts to take shape in terms of what you will have to do so you can start planning and so on. But I cannot give you perhaps an exact answer in terms of you should expect these and that or this level of activity and many other external factors impact it as well in terms of the company's strategy and the market that you are focusing on budget as well because if you are sitting in engineering or in marketing usually there's a budget to sponsor some events regarding the company that you work for as well. And it can open other windows in terms of opportunities, but it is not uh, so easy for you to actually say, oh, you should expect perhaps 10 or 20 events each month or so. No. Yeah, it depends. I remember when I was talking to Adabrel, he told me that he would stay with in his home, with his family, something around 100 days in the year. So I thought it was an average, but as you said, it's not, it depends on several factors, depends on the product. It depends on what project you're working for. Depends on the conferences as well, because they have to accept their talks. So there are many things involved in that. But you made me think about something interesting. I have an idea now because I do have the data regarding my execution for many previous quarters. So I'll try to actually have a look at this data. Yeah. For the previous years. So I'll see how many days. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Because that's another objection from developers. They think, oh, do I really want to become a dev rel and stay that long far from my family? So that's something very important. 
for developers to decide if they want to be a dev rel or not. Absolutely. So, yeah. Other careers in technology are like that as well. If you work in, I don't know, consulting, you have to travel places, visit customers, engage, deliver product showcases and presentations, same thing with perhaps solutions architecture as well. Solution architects, they also, if it depends if we are talking about a digital team or a field team, but the field solution architects, they also travel extensively and the in-person engagements are critical to the actually execution and conversion in terms of if you have a pre-sales practice, that's critical. So the, it's similar to a DevRel role. So, and I agree with you because many engineers, they don't like this side of it. Yeah. But it's, it's a difficult job. But someone has to do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it's the bright side of being DevRel is amazing. Like going to conferences, meeting amazing developers, learning so much, meeting people from different cultures, going yeah, exactly. to other countries. That's amazing as well. Yeah. And I would like to comment on this one because that's what I really love, this opportunity to meet people. And perhaps one of the main highlights is that you will always have an opportunity to talk with brilliant people. And, and some of them you can also call friends, right? Because you meet the guy two, three, five, six times every year at different events and you go and you have dinner together. Like you as an example as well, the, all the Java champions, my case, because I focus on Java and the nice community leaders as well. Also, that's definitely a plus, something that is not measurable in terms of how interesting it is, can't measure it in financial terms or perhaps in terms of the benefits that you get out of those interactions and the relationships. Yeah, that's yeah. also what Venkat Subramanian says. So Venkat is another Java champion. Mm -hmm. And he said that one of the most valuable things about traveling is the friends, the connections he makes. That's, Absolutely. He said that's the most valuable thing he has when traveling, because I don't know uh, if you know, but Venkat Subramanian, there was a year that he went, I think he went for more than 100 job as a group in the year. It was insane. He traveled the whole year giving talk. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah it's so. unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, but I agree yeah. at the end of the day, it's worth uh, the effort of traveling and all those nice things that we talked about. Definitely. I have no doubts. Absolutely. It is the best part of it. Amazing. So Juarez, let's now just recap because I know we talked about that. So if we can recap like in small key points, right? About what developers should do to become a dev rel and what are the techniques developers should implement to stay sharp on their technical skills? Okay. To become a dev rel, don't think that you will be prepared in the future and that something special has to happen in your life. Anything that you create regarding software engineering, a component, if you are learning a new technology or writing simple code or working in the scope of a pilot project, or even with small POCs, you can convert that in some, into something that the community and developers will uh, find value. So you can go and blog about it, about the experience, perhaps explain a new technology or a new library or API. So don't miss those opportunities because with that, you can then, as you start to create content, promote content, and you create a trackable record of contributions to the community. And that's what usually the developer uh, relations hiring managers like to see. That you not only know about technology, but you know how to deliver a message and build a narrative around something that has to be communicated. And the second one is what? Read it again, please. I forgot. The second one is how to stay sharp 
as a software developer? The summary key, point, key points. Okay. As a software developer nowadays, as I said, some people, I would say the most critical one is really core and crucial to this path towards achieving excellence and learning the things the right way is to be disciplined, keep a strong focus on the activities and the goals that you have, right? You need, if you don't have, if you don't have a list of goals, that's possibly the first thing that you have to consider, go work on and create your list. Okay. And try to participate in the communities as well around the technologies that you are actually working with, or you want to become an expert in, right? Because this community and the collaboration with other engineers, even DevRelties, going to events, hackathons participating in workshops, and you can do it both ways. You can go as an attendee, as a student, but you can also be on the other side acting as a presenter, as a speaker, as a mentor, or even as an organizer as or as a supporter, because all the have lifting happens behind the scenes when you organize events. They are also quite enriching activities in general. Okay, so don't miss those opportunities. And in order to stay sharp, of course, you have to be serious. If you really want to master a technology and become one of the best regarding the same tech in, in your field, you have to take seriously and approach it with a strategy, with focus, and of course, by following the trends and not only looking at what you are comfortable with, Sometimes it's important for you to go above and beyond what is expected from you so you can explore all the sides of something that is given as an opportunity for you. Yeah. Just one caveat is to be careful to explore all the things that are above and beyond because uh, you, you need to be expert in specific areas that you that are meaningful in your career, but you need to divide a little bit, right? To be out of your comfort zone, studying AI or studying the, tr the new trends, but you have to give most of your focus on the technologies you chose to focus on, on technologies that you chose to be serious about. I think that's a very good clarification, actually, and I do agree with you 100% because what I said is that going above and beyond is important. If possible, I will always deliver more than what it is expected, but you are right. You should never, ever sacrifice the core critical mass of what is your area and your focus and your field and the technologies that you must know. And, you know, and work with, because at the end of the day, it's your decision in terms of your career and the profile that you want to grow and develop. But at the same time, a good balance in identifying what else can be done is always very interesting or perhaps winning formula for everyone. Amazing. But is thank you so much for uh, your time and for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. I'm really grateful for that. Do you have any suggestion for Java books uh, that you think it's like the best books ever, like books that might have some fundamentals or anything that is important for a Java developer? Well, <laughs> that's a nice one because first, there are so many great Java books, recent ones, and I would be unjust people if I cited one title or two, but what I can say is that uh, there are two interesting books about the JVM now, and I can say the first one is by Otavio Santana. Otavio Santana, yes. Yeah, I'm telling you that because I love JVM as the case, performance stunning, GC algorithms and those things. I used to work for a Unisys Corporation years ago. And at that time, we collaborated with the JBoss group, even before having JBoss acquired by Red Red. 
and I learned a ton about uh, JVMs, and it is a passion that I have, right? And Otavio has a nice book. I started to read it, and there's a second book about the same topic by Oracle Press. And Monica, she is working for Microsoft as part of the Microsoft build of OpenJDK team, as far as I remember. And that's the second one that I have lined up here. So I would recommend those two because they align with my preferences and the topics that I actually vibrate in. I'm really keen about learning and always understanding where things are moving. Yeah. But of course, so many different books for us to talk about. Don't forget to study the classic ones as well from of course, Mount Martin Fowler to you know, all the famous gurus concerning software development and software engineering. But yeah, I will pick up these two books that are JVM related. And the, the offers are great as well. Amazing. Suarez, thank you so much. And thanks for the book's recommendation. And yeah, it was amazing to learn from you. And I'm sure that the Java Challengers audience also learned a lot from your experience and expertise. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Once again, thanks for having me. If you don't mind, just to say I'm a developer evangelist, so I'm a community guy, totally approachable. So if you happen to have additional questions, feel free to reach out to me on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Medium. You will find me, Juarez Jr. I'm more than happy to talk with you. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. And thank you so much again, Rafael. It was nice. Thank you so much. It was nice to have you. And I'm going to leave the LinkedIn profile from Juarez here in the description of this video. If you want, you can reach out to him. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Cheers. <laughs>